here. Good. Thank you. Where are you joining us from tonight? Just so everybody I'm knows. You all. Yeah, I'm joining you all from Columbia, Maryland. Uh, as you can see, the mountains are beautiful in the Chesapeake right now. <laughs> Uh, I've been living here for just over a year, came back recently from uh, an activation actually over in your area in sunny California, uh, and yeah, been back here for about four months, and I'm ready for my next adventure as well. So so everybody knows your background a little bit. Would you classify yourself as a, a mountaineer? Is that is that your specialty? I would. You know, it's it's funny to call myself a mountaineer, if only for the fact that uh, I feel like that's something other people have to call you. <laughs> but I, the best way for me to put it is I have always felt at home in the mountains, like I'm sure many people who are sitting in the audience or watching this stream do as well. And I have found, to bring a little psychology 101 in, that my you could call it self-actualization, my home, my livelihood, always feels the most greatest expressed when I am outdoors. Uh, speaking of which, I heard someone in the audience mention that they're going to uh, Chile pretty soon. The photo behind me is actually uh, from when I used to live in Santiago, and these are the Andes Mountains right outside of Santiago City. You're ruining the magic. I thought we were in Maryland. I was going to make a trip to <laughs> Maryland. So um, you, tonight we brought you in because uh, because you wanted to talk about uh, how you got into adventure. Uh, you had you had a major major um, event happen to you, right? Out out, out on adventure, and then kind of I, I guess you're a risk professional as well, right? So how you yeah. how you calculate risk when you're doing stuff, which is fascinating to me. So why don't we start with just kind of like how you got into adventure, and because and, and you know not everybody's an adventurer, not everybody mm -hmm. goes out and do this. So what what brought you? What kind of was the impetus for you to become uh, an outdoor enthusiast? Sure. So I was born and raised in Florida. Uh, Florida, as you may know, is not particularly known for its mountains, but I was fortunate to grow up in a family that really prized the idea, not only of the outdoors and mankind participating in the outdoors, but the outdoors existing for no other purpose than for themselves, and that mankind is a visitor and our ability to express ourselves in the outdoors is one of the greatest gifts that we have ever been given. Uh, I did a lot of work in Boy Scouts when I was younger. Uh, I used to work at a Boy Scout camp from 2009 to 2013 during the summers when I uh, was an undergraduate. And that really kind of kick-started just my love of, at the risk of sounding cliche, everything possible to do with the outdoors. Uh, from then on, I finished my undergraduate. Uh, I remained in my hometown for a couple years, and then I kind of at the spur of the moment applied for a position in Alaska, which is very different from Florida, where I was going to be working with sled dogs. It's hmm. actually where I met Phoebe Piper, who uh, very graciously helped set this up, and it, it was great to speak with her. Uh, and from then on, I believe some of my supervisors and coworkers have called me an adrenaline junkie, yeah. but I think the best way to put it is just to go back to that sheer level of actualization and love that I feel in the outdoors. So would you say that then when, you, when you're out there, do you, do you focus more on like technical climbing or hiking, mountaineering? Like what, I, I think we had some pictures that we, we definitely want to show of you, of you hanging off some cliff faces. So uh, what's, your, what's your style? Like what, what, what kind of mountaineering do you get into? My number one focus has always been winter mountaineering. Uh, I cut my teeth on the White Mountains of New Hampshire, uh, which bills itself as having some of the worst weather in the world. And in my experience, it, it, it definitely deserves that reputation. Uh, even though I grew up in Florida, I've always felt more at home in cold weather. I went to graduate school at the University of Michigan, go blue. And uh, as I said before, I lived in Alaska for some time as well. So the idea of being in the environment that challenges me physically, spiritually, but especially mentally, I get the most out of winter mountaineering in particular. Hmm. I've, uh, a few years ago, I took up technical climbing. Uh, I actually started ice climbing in Michigan before I had ever done normal uh, sport climbing outside, but I have started sport climbing since I've been home in Maryland, 
and it's quickly become one of my favorite activities that I could possibly do. So to answer your question, I would say it's mostly a mixture of mountaineering, um, long distance hiking especially, and now slowly evolving into more technical climbing for the sake of responsibly pushing myself into bigger, better, and ultimately more fulfilling activities. So, so do you want to tell us about, about the, this incident that you had out there? I, I think it was the Tahoe. You were hiking up near Tahoe. When was this, by the yeah. way? So this was last year in July, uh, July 14th, 2020, to be exact. So to give some context, I work in emergency management, and emergency management requires some level of travel, uh, as you can imagine. And for uh, the last year, I was in California to participate and assist with some of the COVID-19 response. Uh, I had never been to California before. In fact, my only experience on the West Coast was when I moved to Alaska. Uh, and I was a very fortunate to be only about an hour, hour and a half away from the Lake Tahoe area, about three hours from Yosemite. So for me, it was, I wanted to take as much advantage of this as I could, responsibly, of course, understanding that COVID-19 pandemic is going on. Uh, I wanted to be responsible both for my own health, the health of my, my family and friends, and also, of course, my colleagues and my coworkers. I wouldn't be a very good public health professional if I were to, to break that and be irresponsible. And solo hiking was a very good way for me to continue to experience the outdoors while also kind of still maintaining social distancing and facilitating uh, the proper quarantine throughout the COVID-19, the, the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic. So in July, July 14th, I was doing a hike of Pyramid Peak, which is in the Desolation Wilderness outside of Lake, Lake Tahoe. Uh, the Pacific Crest Trail runs through it. It has some of the more famous mountains outside of Lake Tahoe, such as the mentioned Pyramid Peak, uh, Rubicon Peak, as well as Mount Talak, and I believe I've said that correctly. I know Lake Tahoeans have corrected on me on that before. Uh, I was hiking up Pyramid Peak with the idea of doing a traverse from Pyramid Peak to the northern Mount Price. Now, for anyone who's had experience in the Desolation Wilderness, you might know that there is a pretty severe ridge line that connects the two mountains. Uh, and for those who aren't familiar, I highly recommend you look at photos because it's pretty, pretty beautiful and pretty intense. Uh, I had just finished summiting Pyramid Peak and was planning to complete the traverse when I noticed that the route that I had chosen was not a very good idea, for lack of better words. There was a trail uh, carved in the rock that was to my left, so west of where I was that was on much flatter ground, a lot less steep, and still went over to the next peak that I planned on going on. Uh, I decided to attempt to make a, not really a shortcut, but a route down to this from the ridge line that I was at, and a combination of poor route finding, in addition to the dusty talus slope that makes up so much of the fractured rock that is the uh, alpine higher elevation area of California uh, resulted in me slipping and falling approximately 20 to 25 feet. Um, I broke my collarbone in three places, which there are going to be some lovely photos of later. I had a subdural hematoma, a right skull fracture as well. Uh, I went partially deaf in my right ear. I broke my nose and I also had some Jeez. severe facial lacerations, uh, some of which we'll see if the... Uh, video takes it up but all right we, we don't need that because we, we have to pick so for those of you <laughs> those of you with weak stomachs avert avert your eyes right and phoebe can can we see him hiking down the trail after this uh -oh. Ooh. <laughs> there it is can you put that up for for, for the um yeah there it is so yeah. <laughs> so, so this uh, is the, obviously the with the adrenaline can I tell is the pumping story right that photo? yeah let's let's hear the story <laughs> about this photo Sure. So uh, in order to get off of off of the mountain where I fell, uh, I fell at about 9,800 feet. Uh, and to put this in context, I parked at about 7,200 feet and I was at the very top of the scramble. I scrambled down about 1,600 feet um, toward a trail near a lake that I knew was very commonly, commonly taken with the hopes that I would run into someone. I did. Uh, and in my dazed and confused state, I asked them, 
hey, how bad does it look? And they were just like, it looks pretty bad. Do you want to see? So they, they, uh, they very kindly took a photo of me and showed me. And that photo has made quite the rounds among my friends and family because this past December, uh, my girlfriend's family turned it into a Christmas ornament that sat on top of the tree. <laughs> So let, let's, you, we, you got some more damage pictures here, right? Can we see some more, some of the, mm -hmm. I think there's an x-ray of your, your uh, clavicle being broken, right? Put that oh, up there. there. Uh, yeah, let's put that up there. So that, yeah, that's definitely not attached. Yeah. And, and then you have some of, the, some of these, oof. That, so they, is, that is before uh, getting the stitches. Those are the facial lacerations. Wow. She's going to start talking to me. Yeah. Yeah. Just so you know, nobody here is looking away. Everybody, everybody's, everybody's into it. That's the type of club it is. Nobody's squeamish about it. Um, oh wow. So um, yeah, because as you said, you fell 25 feet, and you know people be like, "Well, what's 25 feet?" So this was pretty rough terrain, right? Yeah. Yeah. I 10 feet doesn't seem that high when you just say 10 feet or 20 feet or 25 feet. But uh, imagine you fell two stories, and imagine you fell two stories, not on the grass, which would hurt enough and probably also break some bones, but on, as I said, a, a fractured, rocky slope of boulders rather than any type of possibly cushioning terrain. I have said before that I'm very proud of myself for what I did. I do not consider it a good incident by any stretch of the imagination. In fact, I had to go through a lot of self-reflection to see like, why did I fall? Why did I choose this route? But that being said, I'm very proud of myself for self-rescuing and getting out on my own. Uh, I did not die on a mountain that day. I scrambled a mile and 1800 feet down on a talus slope and then hiked another four miles out with, uh, with a couple who helped me get the help that I needed. And I'm still alive today. And I'm still climbing and hiking today. I have not lost any of my love for the outdoors. Uh, in fact, it's only increased my respect for it, I would say. Have you gone back to complete that hike? Yeah. So real quick, I was going to ask you, um, when the adrenaline wore, wore off, what did it feel like? Because you, you, you were, you were mm -hmm. obviously hopped up on a lot of adrenaline. To, to make that happen, to get off that mountain. It was probably smart to make, make it happen as fast as possible. But what did it feel like when, when that wore off? Were you already, I mean, uh, South Lake Tahoe does have, you know, emergency room, right? Were you basically straight to the emergency room or what? So we actually drove to Placerville uh, because Placerville was uh, a little bit closer to like the Sacramento area. So we figured if I needed to be transported to a trauma center, we would have been closer. Huh. Uh, that ended up happening. Um, I, so the people that I met were a husband and wife couple uh, who were very, very kind, very supportive. I'm still friends with them to this day. The wife drove my car with me in it while the husband followed behind with her truck. And uh, hmm. once they realized that I wasn't going to die, not to sound too morbid, uh, first off, I was so high on adrenaline that I was cracking jokes the entire time. And I remember one time saying, after hiking that five miles out, if I die now, my ghost is going to be pissed. Uh, and they were also joking along with me, saying that they had a 19-year-old son who usually enjoys coming to go hiking with them. But he didn't hike with them that day because he thought that trail was boring. And so they're kind of laughing about how they had a great <laughs> story to tell him after the fact. Uh, so yeah, I, about the adrenaline wearing off, when I was coming down off the mountain, I did not know that my injuries were nearly as bad as they were. I, I knew that I was losing a lot of blood, uh, just be, because that's kind of hard to ignore when you have facial lacerations like that. But I did not know that my collarbone was broken until I started feeling a little bit sore, because at one point I had pressed down on the rock to lift myself up. And I remember putting my hand there and thinking that uh, I didn't feel a collarbone, I just felt an indent. Mm. And as we were driving to the uh, Placerville emergency room is when the adrenaline started running off, excuse me, started going away. And I felt that severe, just soreness everywhere because then all the bruises were coming, then my head was starting to hurt from the, last, from the, from the skull fracture. Uh, 
I, I actually didn't even know my nose was broken until after I was out of the ICU uh, three days later, just because not only the adrenaline, but everything was just sore in a way that I cannot really possibly describe, like sore and tired and exhausted in a way I really hope no one ever experiences. Uh, in, in wilderness first response, as well as in self-rescue, you're always taught to ensure that the victim doesn't go to sleep uh, because of there, there could be intracranial pressure, but also that, that level of soreness and that when the adrenaline wears off, you're going to be in so much pain when you come to. And I was starting to feel that. So I, I, wanna, I wanna talk about like your response and how this has changed, how, how you do solo stuff in the back country. Mm -hmm. But I wanna acknowledge a question from the audience. And by the way, we will have a Q and A at the end. So um, if, if you have a question for, for Dylan, you know, at the end we do pass around a mic and do a Q and A. But the question was, um, and this kind of goes along with how, how, you, how, how you've changed after this incident, did you go back and conquer that route? Or did you look at that route and be like, well, there it is, but you know, not making the same mistake twice. So I, it's funny you say that. I have a uh, professional mountaineering goal of climbing what are called the Tahoe Ogle Peaks. There are, if I believe, 67 prominent peaks that have been identified as important to the mountaineering community in Lake Tahoe, or just are culturally significant from early settlers and from Native Americans in the area. Uh, and I, I have a goal of doing all 67 in the winter. I've done 15 so far. I have not done Pyramid Peak yet in the winter. I've only done it in the summer. So I will be going back and I fully intend on taking a nice photo because I remember exactly where I fell and giving a thumbs up or continuing on from there instead of, uh, yeah, I, I don't want to let it beat me. Um, mind you, I'm not going to go on that ridge trail, but I do have some interest in going back where I was to be like, this was a huge event in my life. And I want to recognize that for having some influence into the man and the outdoorsman that I am today. Yeah, so, so going into this, you, you weren't an amateur by any stretch. You know, you mentioned you were in Boy Scouts and you've been doing this your whole life. So, you know, everybody always has something to learn, right? You're always mm -hmm. progressing your skills, but you were by no means at the a, an amateur, and, and you know, Tahoe, Tahoe's easily accessible, so you could be, right? It's not in the middle of nowhere. Uh, so, so how has it fundamentally changed how you look uh, or how you assess things when you go out there uh, by yourself? So there are three answers I have to that question. The first is I want to bring up the concept of inertia. When you're hiking, when you're really when you're doing any outdoor activity, it's very tempting to see the culmination or the goal of I'm, I'm going to use hiking as my continued example, your goal to reach the peak, like I need to get to Mount Price, I need to finish this traverse. What I've come to realize is that's not true. Your goal is to get home. There's always going to be another mountain. There's always going to be that peak. There's always going to be whatever you are trying to do. And if something does not feel safe, or if I'm doing something and I realize I'm off route and, oh, maybe I could take this little shortcut down so that I can get to the next peak or continue along this ridge line. Like, no, that's, that's not what I should be doing. What I should be considering is what is the safest way for me to get back to where I was, either to go home and try again and reconsider whatever route I wanna take or, or whatever. But I, I think that the concept of inertia is very important in all outdoor activities. In the sense that like when you're when you're there, maybe it was like me and you just drove an hour and a half to Lake Tahoe. Maybe it's a trip you've been planning for months. When you get there, you can be so tempted to continue going because you've put all this energy, all these resources into reaching that destination that sometimes that tunnel vision can take over. And I feel like for me, I've tried to be a lot better ever since about going through a self-assessment and considering this kind of goes into my second point, which is self-assessment. Like, where am I? How am I doing right now? Am I pushing forward because I feel like I should push forward or am I pushing forward because it's the right thing to do? Uh, and that, that concept of self-assessment really, 
puts in a lot of the, the things that I do and the activities that I have, especially now that I've gotten into more technical climbing. Um, the third concept that I would consider, so the first being inertia, the second being self-assessment, the third is what I consider ha mitigation. So in my field, there's a concept called hazard mitigation. And hazard mitigation refers to reducing the risk, uh, or excuse me, reducing the impact of a hazard as much as you can. I, and I think that previously I had thought of safety as more of a binary than, a, than the space of flows that it really is. Either you're safe or you're not. Either this is a good idea or it's not. And I think a better way to think about it is that there's always going to be some baseline level of risk, some baseline hazard with any outdoor or really any, any lifestyle choice that we have. It is impossible to reduce that risk to zero. It's kind of like background radiation. There's, there's always going to be something in the background that, that, that and it has some type of non-zero risk, but we can choose to reduce that risk as much as we can. And we should either through education, either through physical training or just practicing our skills in lower intensity environments, uh, fulfill that concept of mitigation as best we can. So mm -hmm. those are those are the three kind of paradigm shifts ever since my incident that I would that, that I use in my education. I've done some education with the University of Michigan Climbing Club uh, and some other other areas as well. And those are, that's what I try to bring up. It's, it's this idea of mitigating risk and also not falling prey to this inertia to get to this goal of reaching the peak. The, the goal is always to get home. Right. So yeah, like summit fever, right? I think I've heard yeah. people call it summit fever. So, um, so you've got, you've got three, three steps. One, try to avoid su summit fever by you know, doing honest self-assessment and then you, you mitigate your risk, but you're still out there doing, doing something that's, it's not a non-zero, zero risk is, you know, uh, sitting on the couch and waiting for heart disease to get you, right? <laughs> or, or something, <laughs> but uh, you're out there, so you have to have some sort of drive. You have to have some sort of, you know, uh, I guess, um, desire to accomplish the mission, to hit that peak or to do that route or whatever. So going a little deeper, you, you know, you, you, you've mitigated it, uh, self-assessment's kind of hard in the, in the situation, um, but, but you know, you, you've minimized all your risks. So do you have any like tips and tricks for how you, like what, what's your system? Like what's your turnaround? Like lots of people say like if when you're scuba diving, I, I think we've got a lot of divers out here, right? They say, okay, if three things go wrong, I end the dive, right? So if, if, when my air gets to this point or this, this or that, you know, if, if these things happen, then I'm done. So do you have any like tips or tricks that you can share with us? from the mountaineering side that when you, like these are red flags, that's a red flag and, and I'm out. Sure, sure. Uh, I can think of several off the top of my head. The first and probably most common is the concept of a turnaround time. A turnaround time is the time where you go back no matter what. Like that is, you're not pushing one more minute, you're not pushing five more minutes. You are, you are turning around now. Usually your turnaround time is going to be where you approximate halfway to your goal, your summit goal. And then you will add a few hours or if it's an expedition style, a couple of days. And if you are not at the, the halfway point or excuse me, if you are not at that point by that time, you turn around. And that's right. a really easy metric to just be safe. And so again, you're avoiding that summit fever. You're giving yourself a hard deadline. Uh, one of the other methods that I like to use, this is, this is kind of more, um, insurance for safety is what I call the canary system. The canary system is where I give a copy of my plan, my route to at least three people. Usually this is my girlfriend and then two friends of mine who are also very engaged in, in outdoor recreation. So, so they kind of know what to expect. And the canary system is where I say, hey, I plan on being finished with this 
roots at X <laughs> I gotta interrupt you real quick. I'm sorry. Oh, Go no, ahead. you're good. But we get, we've got this giant hound dog in the room right now. <laughs> and oh. this hound dog is just not having it. <laughs> and, 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 and nobody can see this on YouTube, but this room is just wild out here. So. <laughs> Oh, no. I wonder, I'll, I'll try to say, oh, I almost said C word, but that's probably not good. Because I wonder if Canary is, is making him a little excited. All right. That, that was Leo the Hound Dog for all of you. And, and, and Leo, <laughs> I was trying to keep it together for a little bit there, but I just, I just couldn't. So, I, I mean, I, I, we were starting to lose some people in the audience. I, I like, I'm trying to focus, but some other, and, and I think this is a really important thing. So let's back it up to the Canary sure, system. Sure, sure. Did everybody get the concept of the turnaround time? Yeah, I think it's the idea like if you're flying to Hawaii, right? You know, if you're if 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 you don't have enough gas by the time you reach the halfway point, it's it's better to turn around, right, than to keep going. But once you, yeah, all right. So let's talk about the canary system. Yeah. So so the canary system works where I I give a copy of my route or my plans, everything to uh, at least my girlfriend and two other friends who are very active and engaged in the outdoor community, and I say, hey, I plan on being finished at. X amount of time. If I don't text you or call you at this time, I want you to activate my emergency plan or uh, try to get in contact with search and rescue or fish and wildlife because I should be off by this time. Uh, the canary system is always going to be a backup. It's never something you should rely on, but it's a way that I don't have to do anything in order for it to, to activate. The only thing I have to do is, is get an incident uh, or, or for something to happen. It automatically starts and it can automatically have my friends and family uh, activate any type of search and rescue rather than be like, oh, hey, Dylan hasn't come into work for two days. Right. Uh, the, third, the third thing I would bring up is, and this is kind of the ephemeral one, is weather forecasts everywhere. Uh, I, I, weather is probably, if you were to ask me, the single most common reason why casualties occur in mountaineering. Uh, be that snow, be that heat, heat stroke and heat emergencies, uh, hypothermia, even avalanches I would consider as well. Uh, there, th this is especially relevant in the White Mountains of New Hampshire, which again are, are especially infamous for extraordinarily fickle weather as well as extraordinarily intense weather. One of the scariest hikes I've ever been on in my life was in early August 2019, where I was doing what's called a presidential traverse in a single day, which is where you, you it's, it's roughly, I want to say, 15,000 feet of elevation gain, going over uh, eight prominent peaks in the presidential range or of the White Mountains. Uh, and I got hit from the very beginning of the day with 55 mile an hour winds and up to 65 mile an hour gusts. And th this is just an example of how capricious weather can be during mountaineering and how important it is to pay attention to weather forecasts, even the morning that you start. Uh, weather can change drastically. And if the weather is doing something that you are not comfortable with or that you did not anticipate, again, it's ignore the summit fever, uh, ignore the inertia, just go down and try again. Uh, I, I, this is especially important for, for skiers and avalanche risk as well. Uh, the Sierra Avalanche Center is one of the greatest resources in California, especially in the Lake Tahoe area, as far as I'm concerned, for providing information about uh, upcoming weather, as well as avalanche forecasts, and also showing real time what the snowpack looks like to ensure that you are out in a safe environment, uh, or I should say as safe as can be, and mitigating that risk as much as possible. Hmm. That's fascinating. So, um, you know, we, we touched on it a little bit, but uh, do you feel like after this happened, you kind of got shy of the outdoors, so to speak? Like, was there any was there any time? Because you mentioned you did have to do some self reflection. Oh, did I pick mm -hmm. the right route? How did I screw this up? Because again, you got a lifetime lifetime of being prepared as a Boy Scout, and you know. Doing stuff, and then and then you have this huge event. So, did you find that you were that that you were kind of uh, gun shy, so to speak, to get back out there? A little bit. It's kind of funny, actually, because it didn't hit me uh, until several months later. Uh, I had surgery on my collarbone at the end of July, uh, just 
to, to make sure that I had the best chance of recovery that I could. And I actually started climbing in the gym uh, in September in order to basically do physical therapy, very, very light climbing, but I wanted to get back to my uh, original level of physical fitness and ability as effectively and safely as I could. And then I got activated again to go back to California in November of that year of, of 2020. Uh, and I pretty much hit the slopes doing mountaineering in the area almost immediately again. For, for several weekends, things were going great. I had no fear. I was just really happy to be outside and living in my environment again. But starting in January, I started getting extremely afraid of being on a trail again. Uh, I would not consider that particular aspect to be post-traumatic stress disorder, although maybe it could be. But I remember the night before setting up some hikes, I would lie awake just having this mental image of me going on a trail, it becoming icy or slippery, me being unable to stop, and then sliding and falling. I would have this, this idea in my head going again and again and again. Uh, even though I know logically there's, there's, if there's an icy trail, I can just stop and turn around, but it, it almost felt like there was this inevitability that I was going to fall again. And the only way that I could really combat this is for lack of better words, exposure therapy by hiking, by being outside and developing confidence in my skills again, and knowing not only my limits, but what what can I say I know? Like, what do I know I know? Instead of doubting my skills and feeling like I'm not good enough or that I don't deserve these mountains or the outdoors, being able to say, no, I, I am here. No, I, I am. And just having that I am be its own statement. And that, that took a few months. It really wasn't until the beginning of March where I could go for weekend hikes again, even, even lower altitude ones, and feel comfortable with myself. One of my personal greatest accomplishments that I consider was doing a winter solo hike of Twin Peaks, which is also in the, in the Tahoe area. It's one of the Tahoe Ogles. Uh, it was a 12 mile hike there and back, uh, about 4,000 feet total of, of elevation change, not just not necessarily gain. And when I got to the peaks themselves, it was about a class three scramble to get to the top after I had finished the approach. And I remember just standing here being being terrified, like I'm, I'm going to slip, uh, I'm, my ice axe isn't going to work, I'm, I'm going to hurt myself on these rocks. And I recall just standing there and breathing and kind of going in my head like, okay, what time is it? I have three hours until I hit my turnaround time. Am I thirsty? No, I just had some water and I have plenty more. Am I hungry? No, but I'm going to eat a Cliff Bar now anyway, so I have a little bit of energy. And then it slowly started to become clear to me like, oh, there's a route, there's I, I can probably put my hand on this rock. I can probably take off my snowshoes here and put on my crampons and then step up here. And then I could slowly feel, have my mind work out the route, get to the top, which I did, immediately felt elated, and then get down safely again and make my way home. And it was a real sense of fulfillment that I really can't describe. Uh, again, actualization is the best word I have in realizing myself outside once more. And mm. pretty much after that, I felt, I, I have felt myself being outdoors again. Oh, that's good. So all, all this is kind of premised, and I want to kind of uh, emphasize that this is solo stuff, right? You're, you're out there by yourself. And that, yeah. I, that's fundamentally different because if you have three or four people, if you fall, someone's there immediately. They know you fell, fell. And, and you have mitigation techniques. Are there, I, you know, I always ask, do you, do you carry any gear? Do you have like a spot, you know, or a, or a satellite phone or anything like that that kind of provides you a second layer of backup so people know where you are? Because the canary system lets people know that something's wrong and, and the general location, right? But that, that you know, you got to wait four hours, right, for them to realize that something's wrong, and then they've got to find you. So 
you know, in terms of how remote you are, even with a canary system, you're five, six, seven hours maybe away from rescue, if not more. So is there anything else that you do? Yeah, that's a great point, actually. And it's kind of why I said before that the canary system is always a backup. It should never be your first line of defense if you get in an incident. Uh, interestingly enough, I did not have a beacon on me when I had my fall. And having a beacon is something that I always do. In fact, my girlfriend always uh, checks to make sure it works with me so that we have two eyes on the beacon before I go out uh, for, for exactly that reason. Like if the canary system is great, it, but there could be several hours until someone finds me. And if it's a severe enough incident, that might be too much time. So I do carry a spot beacon now. Uh, they are kind of expensive uh, or, or a Garmin inReach also is a great device, but safety really isn't something you can put a price on and something like a spot beacon, which can immediately alert search and rescue, fish and wildlife, whatever your organization is to your location, that's, that's invaluable. Now you, um, so, so you do, you're a heavy user of the spot, I guess. Um, do, you, do you have it track you the whole way or do you ha just have it on your person and, and you, you press the emergency button? Because I've always wondered about that. It's like, well, if it was a real emergency, I'd have to open this thing up and hold down the button for three seconds. Oh, you, first you gotta flip off the little safety, then you gotta hold it down for three or mm -hmm. 10 seconds. Like, is, am I gonna be able to do that? Like looking through the blood that's, or you, are you? <laughs> So uh, I also have a Garmin inReach if it's a, if, and sometimes I bring the spot, sometimes a Garmin inReach. The Garmin inReach actually does have GPS capabilities for exactly that reason. I, I can't say off the top of my head, but I am pretty sure that it automatically links so that it, it and you're uh, something like a Garmin inReach is registered directly to you and right. you have to register it with that system. So if something does happen that can, pinpoint you based on the route that you have logged or are logging at that time. Right, so does your girlfriend watch you and, and like if, you, if you're stationary for four hours, she's gonna make a phone call or? Uh, I don't know, I should probably ask her about that actually. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Is she really checking up on you or is she just, oh yeah, he's got the spot, he'll be fine. She, she gets nervous for like right, right understandably so, uh, but she, she trusts me and she trusts that whatever I do, I'm going to be safe while I do it now. Uh, and she trusted me before, but I, I would say there's a little bit of nervousness, but it's just because she wants me to come home and so do I. Would, would you classify, before this happened, would you classify yourself as, I guess, a, a, a daredevil? Like, were you playing it fast and loose or were you already a pretty safe dude before, before this happened? I always considered myself more of a conservative hiker than not. Uh, I think that the Boy Scouts really instilled a sense of preventing accidents as much as we, uh, more so than responding to them. So I, I like to push my limits in the sense that I want to learn about myself in addition to wanting to learn the route, you know, bigger and better. I'm sure many people here can, can understand that and probably are similar. Uh, but I don't like taking unnecessary risk. And my incident for me was a good example of an occurrence that wasn't necessarily due to unnecessary risk, but perhaps information asymmetry in either what the route was telling me and what I was picking up on, or even a deficiency in my own education and needing to learn more, uh, practice my skills more, whatever you want to call it before taking on or, or, or before labeling an activity like that as not having that unnecessary risk. Does that answer your question? Kind of sort, like sort of, let, let me, let me uh, put it, I guess, a different sure. way or, or, or go in a different direction. Um, so you spend a lot of time reflecting and, and you said at the beginning, oh, it was poor route finding. Now, after mm -hmm. all the reflection and looking back, do you, do you really think like you screwed something up or do you think it was just, that happens? I think it could be a combination of both. Um, my Some of my outdoor friends say that I'm a little hard on myself for it being a, a poor reflection of my skills. Um, perhaps calling it a poor reflection of my skills is a little too self-effacing, but I do think that part of what I did was not the best idea. And at the same time, I think that that is easy to say in retrospect. 
Right. I think hindsight very much is 2020. And when you're in that moment, things aren't necessarily clear. And I think for me, and in addition to, I could have, I could have done better. I think it also is something that does happen. I, I think that you can take as much precautions as you can. And I think that you can, you can think you're taking as many precautions as you can, but sometimes things do still happen. Uh, and I think that's the, the fact that we have to accept as adventurers that maybe this will happen. And the only thing we can do after it is find a way to learn from it, find a way to talk to other people about it and not, not let us, not, not let it scare us. Cause yeah. if it scares us, then w what are we going to do? How are we going to come back from that? Yeah, that well said. So I, I do want to take a little bit of time to go through some of these pictures that you gave us here. Cause I, I think there was some impressive stuff up there. So Phoebe, we can skip over all the gory stuff because because we got the we got the idea. <laughs> you really <laughs> messed yourself up there. But you did you gave us some other pictures of you doing some cool stuff. Can we take a look at those real quick before before we go into Q and A? We got those up there. A computer stall. Ah, there we go. So why don't you why don't you tell us about this one real quick? Yeah, just you all over the place, huh? <laughs> yeah, so this was actually in Chile. Um, in 2019, I did an internship in Chile in Santiago with the uh, Universidad uh, de Chile with the Faculty of Medicine there. Uh, I, I am an epidemiologist. I recently finished my master's of public health in epidemiology. I focus, in addition to emergency management, on environmental illness and environmental diseases. So I was there to uh, actually do some work with air pollution. Point being why I'm saying this, uh, we had a four day weekend once. And so a couple of my friends and I took a trip up to the Atacama Desert. And this was uh, a photo I took at the very top of uh, what is called the Valle de la Luna or the Valley of the Moon, um, looking out just over this broad expanse of, of gravel and sand and the desert, pretty much as far as the eye can see with, uh, if you look in the top right, some volcanoes even in the background. So wherever you go, like th this job is, and, and I guess I guess is a good time to be in your field, lots of work right now, right? <laughs> it's not boring. <laughs> it's not boring right now, that's for sure. So wherever you go, you're, you're out there doing something. That, that's what you do. We, 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 when you've got free time, you've got a four-day weekend, you're out there enjoying going on some adventure. Let's I, take I a look at some so. of the rest I've, of these, Phoebe. I've, I've, I've talked to one of my colleagues before that part of the reason why I'm in my career is because it does get me to travel to cool places. Uh, but I, I also, again, not to sound cliche, but I have a gen, genuine love of helping other people. And uh, that's the reason I got into public health. Um, so being able to hike and see these beautiful places and then share them with others and show them how gorgeous and worthwhile our world is, is, you know, it's the best of both worlds. Let's just let's personally. just throw these up, Phoebe, and, and and roll through them real quick, and we'll we'll so yeah, Some cool stuff. Oh yeah, that's the route. <laughs> that's Mount Price in the background. You can see that ridge line. Wow. So I just want to make the make the point. I, I mean, you know, looking at these, like you, you're not new, you know, and and, and you were, I think for every every. Uh, Every mountaineering route, I'm sure someone's fallen off of it, right? Fair to say? Yeah, yeah. I would, yeah. I, if, if they haven't, they've definitely thought they will. Yeah. So, so th this is nothing new to you. And yeah, I, I can't help to think that you probably are being too hard on yourself. You know, they, they, we talked about how you said there's never non-zero, right? There's always some risk out there. <laughs> so, I mean, you, I mean th this is your field. You know that, like, <laughs> at a certain point, it, it's going to come up, right? You roll the dice enough, you know, it's going to happen. So maybe, maybe, I don't know. That's just my, my opinion. No, no, I see what you mean. I mean, it's, it's tempting to be like, what if I had all of the information? Like, what if I knew exactly how many dust particles are on this rock and, and exactly how much the wind is blowing and the perfect humidity? Like, theoretically, sure, maybe I could then make my risk to zero, but we don't live in that perfect understanding. And as you're saying, yeah, if we accept that and are comfortable with it and do what we can, then that's, that's what we can do. Yeah. And we're glad you're alive. That's for sure. 
So yeah, um, we, we'd like to do a little bit of q and A. I'm sure I'm sure a lot of people in the audience would, would like to ask you a question. So um, and, and then if there's any questions in the chat, we'll catch those from Phoebe. But Alec Alec is going to pass a microphone around. Please wait till you get the microphone so that people uh, on YouTube can hear. Does anybody have a question? There we go. So my question is, why solo? Like, I do some of the craziest shit in the world, but I never do it alone. And when I do, I usually regret it. I recently got lost hunting and was out there for hours alone. And I was so pissed because I was like, you know, I violated my number one rule of being alone. So I'm curious, you all your adventures seem like they're alone. Why solo? So part of it is because of necessity. Uh, like when I was in California last year, uh, I didn't I, I did not know anyone in the area in California, and I didn't want that to stop me, so I still went hiking. Uh, I also, I, I consider myself very, very extroverted, but when it comes to the outside, I feel the most comfortable and I feel happiest when I'm alone. Um, I also, so I do a lot of endurance hiking. Uh, I've mentioned the White Mountains before, so I've done, for those who are familiar, like a single day. Um, hut traverse. Uh, I've done a penny traverse in it or a penny loop in a day as well. Um, and it's just, it's also kind of easier to do some of those things solo because of the level of physical endurance that's sometimes needed. And I don't necessarily say that to sound good about myself. It's just a fact of those types of routes. Uh, but I also like, I have moved and lived in a lot of different places. And if I waited to find partners I was comfortable with before going hiking, then that would cut down my hiking time by two thirds. Uh, that, now, this being said with like technical climbing, oh, I'm never solo with technical climbing. I always am going with people, always going with people I trust. Right. Yeah, some of, the, some of those hut traverses in the, in the White Mountains, they're, they're gnarly. I remember <laughs> looking down and I see this hut and it's like probably 2,000 feet down. I'm like, oh, man, and then the trail goes back up another 2,000 feet. <laughs> <laughs> well, what's crazy is when you see the uh, the staff who have to carry all of the food for resupplies. Oh, yeah, and they've got those big and, backboards. Yeah, yeah, and, and they're all like 60 pounds. Man. <laughs> so can you talk about your experiences with, <clears throat> with ice climbing? Are you doing frozen waterfalls? Or, and what's the, uh, the appeal there? Uh, yeah, I... It, I love climbing because it's it's as much a mental sport as it is a physical sport. I feel like my brain is working on a puzzle with every move and every movement. Uh, ice climbing I particularly love because uh, it, 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 it's another facet of that. I also just love being in the cold. Um, I haven't been able to do too much ever since I finished graduate school and with the COVID-19 pandemic occurring. When I was in graduate school though, I went to a place called Peabody Ice Climbing, which is where that photo is from. Uh, Peabody Ice Climbing has one of the only permanent ice climbing facilities, and it's basically just this huge, massive structure that water is poured down and then frozen over a span of days that then you can practice uh, top rope ice climbing up in addition hmm. to mixed climbing. That's pretty cool. Yeah, um, this upcoming winter, COVID, uh, of course, being considered, I plan on going to Michigan Ice Fest up in the Upper Peninsula, which for anyone listening isn't excellent opportunity for people who have never ice climbed before to get interested in the sport, as well as uh, even people who have done a lot also. It's a, who, it's a great melding of levels of experience. Who knows there's a reason to go to Michigan in the winter? <laughs> <laughs> Adventure. <laughs> yeah. All right, where's that, where's that mic? David, yeah. So I don't know how to formulate this as a question, but I've done a lot of boating and never filed a float plan. I've done a lot of solo boating. I know I should, but I don't want to foreclose the ability to change my plan and follow the, if you see the beautiful bit of wildlife, if you see that sunset you want to sit down and watch. Is there a way to reconcile getting out there and doing stuff, but having it open-ended where you preserve some flexibility? Well, that's a question. Yeah, I, so I, I think yeah. that's an excellent question, actually. Uh, it's definitely something that I consider as well. Um, I, first off, I think it depends kind of on the activity. Like, I think it's easy for me to say with hiking, oh, I'm going to do this loop, like 
I, I know that it, it like I'm, I'm not going to bushwhack, for example, or something along those lines. Like I'm going to follow this trail. I would say for other activities where your route can be more free form, having some type of plan such as a float plan that can at least provide a general area or, a, or, or maybe even just like a starting and a stopping point is better than nothing. Uh, and that also, as you're saying, gives you the freedom to go check out this, this other area or check out this other thing. Uh, when I've done some uh, traverses or some longer endurance hikes, I will say like, hey, this other mountain or something is coming up. I might go check this out. I might not. But at least it, it, doesn't, it doesn't set me to this very particular route. Um, I, I might set myself to something very particular if I know it's going to be especially strenuous. That way I don't get distracted and then exhaust myself or something similar. Does that answer your question? He gives you the thumbs up, yeah. All right, Alec. Hi, Dylan, we have a couple questions from the chat. <clears throat> um, first, I guess this is kind of a two-parter, but it seems like uh, I could probably merge them together. Uh, first, what is your favorite piece of gear? And then second, who is the dog? that you're frequently pictured with? <laughs> well, the dog has a story. Uh, I'll answer that one first, actually. So when I lived in Alaska, uh, I did glacier tours for five months on the Mendenhall Glacier outside of Juneau. Uh, we had 286 sled dogs that myself and a crew of about 15 to 17, depending on the, the time of the season, work to, to help out with. Uh, that dog in the background is, was a lovely Alaskan Husky named Corvette, named because she was a little red Corvette, who uh, quickly became my buddy and my best friend. Uh, at the end of the season, I talked to her musher and was able to adopt her, give her a nice little retired life for five years, and she was my buddy and my best friend. That dog, I'm pretty sure, holds the record for doing all of the, all 48 of the 4,000 footers in uh, New Hampshire in the shortest amount of time, because she did them um, in 20 days with me at the uh, ripe age of 14. So mm. she was easily the most athletic pooch I've known, and I hope to grow up to be her. It was probably uh, easy for her, you know, she, like, it's retirement, right? I just have to walk oh, up yeah. the mountain, I don't have to carry this sled and all these other dogs, yeah. <laughs> Well, I remember this great time when uh, she experienced a bed for the first time, got her out of her kennel, brought her inside, which already blew her mind. She jumped up on the bed, like immediately rolled in the sheets and made all these happy grunting noises. And then I'm pretty sure she slept for two days. <laughs> uh, so to answer the other question, uh, my favorite piece of gear, uh, if I had to say for, for hiking in particular, uh, oof. You know, no one's actually ever asked me that. Um, I am going to say be a little boring and say that I love my black diamond uh, trekking poles. I think hiking poles are like grossly underestimated because they just can they can give your arms a little more of the weight and take it off your legs a little bit, give yourself like a little more stability. And if you're going up like class two terrain, maybe not class three, but definitely class two, it, it gives you a little bit more stability and a little bit more um, integrity in your movement and your hike. So, so follow up, did you get the ones, the whippets on top? Because Mark out here introduced me to the ones with the whippets and those are, those are fantastic. You, you mean like putting your hands through them? No, no the, the, the black diamond poles, you can get a model that has like a little tiny, it's called a whippet. It's got a little tiny ice axe on it. Oh, no, I have not yeah. seen those. Uh, you know, I, I'm going to have to check that out, but you mentioned ice axe. I would say the number two favorite piece of gear is an ice axe because an ice axe is incredibly useful. And knowing like how to do a self-rescue with an ice axe, knowing how to use an ice axe when you're uh, like on a slope or, or doing a traverse is one of the great, it's one of the greatest tools you can possibly have. Cool. Thanks. Okay, next question, Alec. All right, we got one more. Uh, so with regards to climbing Pyramid Peak, uh, we have a question. If you climbed up uh, via Horsetail Falls and if the plane crash is still there, 